I'd like to thank everybody for joining our Behavior Masterclass Series in Behavioral Economics uh, applied to pharmaceutical market research and marketing. My name is Channing Stave and I'm Chief Operating Officer for Neuristics and I'll be leading today's class. Uh, if people have any questions, please feel free to um, stop me. Otherwise, I'll um, go through the slides and then we'll also have some time for questions at the end. So um, Behavior is a once-a-month masterclass, which it's customized to train pharmaceutical marketing's marketers and researchers on applying behavioral science to target customer decision-making. Uh, for each of these um, classes, which occur once a month, we'll introduce two heuristics. We'll spend some time showing the impact on customer psychology, teach you how to apply them to marketing, have some time for Q&A, and then um, you'll be able to take the learnings from this and start applying behavioral science economics, behavioral science yourself as you move forward in your day-to-day -day job. So the first heuristic that we're gonna cover is a pretty exciting one, um, dread risk bias. Um, dread risk bias is this idea that we can be convinced that an extreme catastrophic event can occur easily by feeding the fear of its outcome, even if statistics may suggest otherwise. So we have a picture here, and you can see that we have this um, guy, he's wearing a USA um, shirt, and he's worried about Ebola. Now what's interesting is that you can see that he's um, definitely overweight. He's not worried about the 300,000 deaths per year that are caused by obesity. He's smoking a cigarette, but again, he's not concerned about the 450,000 deaths caused each year by tobacco, and he's um, drinking a beer along with his soda. Uh, and he's not worried about the 86,000 deaths caused each year by alcohol. His concern is Ebola. Now, um, if you recall, Ebola had a total of 18 cases in the US, seven of which were evacuees from other countries. So that means that there were only 11 native cases and then only two people out of 350 million Americans actually died from Ebola. So the odds of dying from Ebola were about one in 175 million. So you actually would have had a better chance of winning uh, Mega Millions or Powerball. But because Ebola was in the news every day, it was um, the cover story very often. Whereas like if you were worried about obesity or tobacco or alcohol abuse, um, and then their impacts, um, you probably find, find that on page 17 or 18 of the, um, of the newspaper, and if at all. Um, so this really triggered this dread risk bias, which is this idea that people worry about these outcomes that are very, very unlikely, but if they occur, they have devastating out outcomes. So a good example kind of in real life of dread risk bias is rental car insurance. Um, many credit cards will cover you for vehicle damage on rental cars. Virtually all of them will. However, rental car companies have successfully made millions of dollars selling this insurance as an add-on, even to the best drivers. So the odds of actually having an accident when you um, rent a car are very, very low. I mean, one in a thousand, one in 10,000. And then the odds that your credit card company wouldn't um, actually help you, again, extremely low. And then most people also have their own personal insurance that would cover them. So people already have two sets of insurance that would have them covered. But because they see this insurance is offered and then they imagine that they're going to have an accident and then they're going to have a major problem, they buy this rental car insurance. And the other thing to keep in mind is the rental car insurance, it's not uncommon for it to be $10, $20, $30 a day. So at $20 a day each year, that would be $7,000 for that insurance. That's seven to 10 times more expensive than what you would actually be paying for your personal insurance, which would also cover you. But again, a huge percent of people actually buy this rental car insurance. So an example a little closer to home in the pharmaceutical space is HPV. It thrives on dread risk bias. Um, so there has been some studies done where um, a product, product X, was utilized um, to try and prevent HPV. 
And then um, what's been done is it's, um, it's very effective. So 99.9% .9 of the time or less, you're not going to end up diagnosed and not going to suffer from HPV if you actually take this product. But what's interesting is that even if you don't take the product, the odds of getting cancer, it's um, typically under 1% depending on the type of cancer. And then even general awards, which would be the most likely outcome, would only be about 2%. But this idea that people are worried that they wouldn't want to get, like, um, they wouldn't want to get a cancer due to HPV, so it drives people to actually um, get the treatment. And then what furthers this is if you look at these very small percents, they, they could actually talk about that 50 to 70 times less people would get cervical cancer or um, other types of cancers by using the treatment. So by leveraging racial preference bias, along with dread risk bias, you're able to get people to think, wow, this is like serious. I'm 50 times less likely to get this disease if I use product X. So that makes a lot of sense because I don't wanna end up with cancer. I don't wanna die from having HPV. So I wanna do everything I can to avoid it. But the reality is that even if you didn't um, actually get the treatment, the odds of actually having a disease would be very low. As an example of um, a message that can be kind of written to actually feed dread risk bias, there was an original message, which was the potential for severe immune-related adverse events. So that's a pretty basic message. And um, so if you think about it, potential for severe immune related adverse events. Sounds a little bit concerning, but what is the potential? How severe are they? Um, and it doesn't really drive a lot of actions. On the other hand, if you change the message to patients are at increased risk of dangerous and sometimes fatal immune related events, this really drives dread risk because we don't talk about how likely it is. It's just an increased risk. But the fact that it's dangerous and sometimes fatal and it's then immune-related, it makes it a really powerful message because nobody wants to be at increased risk of something that's dangerous and potentially fatal. That's a major, major concern. So by changing the message, it makes it a much more powerful message that's going to make somebody want to find more about treatments and then do anything they can to avoid the actual impact of this. So before we move on to the second um, heuristic, just wanted to see um, if there's any questions in the audience. Okay. So now what I'll do is I'll move on to the um, second heuristic, which is um, satisficing. Okay, so satisficing is this idea that in our daily lives, we typically do not look for ideal solutions but we look for alternatives that are good enough. Uh, satisficing is actually um, kind of a, a related heuristic to compromising. Uh, so for many of the heuristics that we work on, there's often two heuristics that kind of can work almost um, opposite, that the two sides of the same coin. So satisficing is this idea that we don't necessarily look for the ideal solution. We look for like an alternative that's good enough or what we'll do is we'll kind of look for an alternative and then once we find the first one that's good enough, we stop searching. Compromising, on the other hand, is this idea that only the best is good enough. So as an example, um, compromising Mercedes and Starbucks both use that, that if it's not Starbucks, it's not worth drinking. If it's not a Mercedes, why would you drive it? So that's that idea of compromising. But today what we're doing is talking about satisficing, which is really kind of the opposite side of this. So one example of satisficing is this um, idea, this temp tooth. So this idea is becoming an orthodontist for only $25. So the idea here is that you get dental tools at home, you get some materials that you're able to use um, to work on for your teeth, and it only costs $25. If you think about how much it costs, typically for an orthodontist, um, braces will typically be three, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000. Now, all of a sudden, for $25, you can get a similar experience. I mean, the question obviously would be how similar the experience would be. 
But this idea would be that, okay, um, I could go to the orthodontist and then I'm going to have to take out some loans. I'm not going to be able to afford it. Or for $25, I can actually achieve something that's going to be good enough and get my teeth looking better. So you see the picture in the box, the teeth look perfect. Um, they're perfectly white, they're perfectly straight. Um, and then it gives people this sense that it's going to provide a solution that's nearly as good as they would if they actually went to a real orthodontist. And then even the tools, they look like they're pretty similar to what you would get at the orthodontist. Um, but probably when you actually went into the box, hard to imagine for $25, they're going to give you those three metal tools as well as other things that are going to truly make your teeth look that much better. Um, here we have an example of a video um, which shows another way kind of satisfying can come into play. Hi, I'm Frank. I take Movantic for OIC. I had a bad back injury. My doctor prescribed opioids, which helped with the chronic pain, but backed me up. Tried prunes, laxatives, still constipated. So this, um, it's, this is an example for um, uh, Movantic, which is an opioid that helps with relatively severe pain. And what's interesting is the satisfying is leveraged twice here. The first, and it's actually really fighting against satisfying an ex extent. The first way that satisfying is leveraged is it actually, in essence, the opioid, <coughs> it does a good job of fighting the pain, but obviously it creates other problems. So a true solution that would compromise would have great efficacy, great safety, would be low cost. <coughs> in this particular case, you have a solution that has good efficacy and um, assumingly if it's covered would have reasonable cost, but it has some major side effects. Now, instead of trying to solve this immediately, I mean, so with the opioid, um, trying to go immediately to something that's going to really solve the problem, he tried solutions that weren't um, good enough. He tried prunes, he tried some um, kind of very basic laxatives, but none of those worked well enough. And then the point of the commercial is that that's not good enough. So then what you need to do is find a solution that actually will truly meet your needs. So this particular ad is really fighting satisfying. So it's saying don't accept a solution that's barely good enough and it's going to leave you in severe discomfort when that's actually what you're trying to solve for. But find a solution that actually is going to resolve that major discomfort so you can take care of your pain. And then on top of that, you can actually avoid um, uh, additional side effects and discomfort. Hi, I'm Frank. I take Movantic for... Then our second example... Maybe we should try moving the router. Slide it on your wireless router and you're good to go. This is Eero. Let's do this. Sweet. It's not a router. It's a Wi-Fi system. Already in your inbox. <laughs> Finally. Wi-Fi that works. So this is an example where people, a lot of people make do with subpar Wi-Fi at home. And then they do things. They try and move the router. They um, go up on their roof. They try and move the antenna. They'll do all these small things, move the satellite around. But the reality is that they're never going to have like the Wi-Fi that they've been promised that they're paying for and that they actually need to get their work done. So this product, again, it's fighting satisfying by saying, instead of making do with an option that's barely good enough, find an option that's actually going to truly meet your needs. So an example of a message that could fight um, satisfying here, um, the original message was consistent PFS benefit across all subgroups including patients with concerning clinical characteristics in trials A and B. So the message hits satisfying head on. No need to settle. PFS can be improved in endocrine therapy naive patients or patients who recurred or progressed on endocrine therapy. So that no need to settle. That is a direct fight against satisfying. Uh, so it's really saying that there's no need for you to satisfy. You can actually get something that's going to work. And then we also leverage rule of consistency here. So um, PFS can be improved in endocrine therapy naive patients 
or patients who recurred or progressed on endocrine therapy. So one of the things is that projective rule of consistency is this idea that we want products that are consistent again and again. We don't like products that act differently with different people and that you can't fully count on. So in this particular case, what it's really showing is that for these patients, it's gonna help them no matter what. Uh, so whether you're in uh, endocrine therapy naive, you've recurred or you've progressed on endocrine therapy, this product is actually going to provide you with benefit. So another example for us to really think about kind of um, when we think about satisfaction and compromising is often with physicians. Um, some physician, you can segment physicians based on heuristics. So some physicians will really satisfy more, whereas other physicians are much more looking to compromise in their treatment. Uh, in areas where the treatment is um, done by both PCPs and by specialists, it would not be unusual for the PCPs to be more likely to satisfy. The average PCP has about six minutes with each patient. So what they want to look for is they want to understand what's the patient suffering from, and then they want to quickly figure out what is a solution that may help that patient. Um, and so then um, in that six minutes, you spend... Um, two or three minutes diagnosing, figuring out what the problem is, one or two minutes figuring out um, what the treatment should be, you write the script, see if they have any questions, move on to that next patient. Whereas a specialist would be more likely to want to compromise. So they're gonna really look deeply at the patient, they're gonna understand the patient inside and out, and then they're going to want to figure out what is the best tailored solution for that patient. Uh, so compromises are going to be more likely to be spreaders, whereas satisficers might be more likely to have one of two products that they can use across all of their patients. So it's just kind of another way to kind of think about how satisficing works and how physicians and satisficing really go together, especially for a certain subset of those physicians, whereas other segments of physicians might be a lot more likely to really want to compromise. So recapping what we've talked about thus far, um, we discussed two different heuristics. The first one is dread risk bias. This idea that catastrophic events, no matter how rare, cause us to stay as far away from anything that may lead to them. So this can really be leveraged um, for rare diseases, talking about some of the um, potential outcomes to make sure that people do get screened or diagnosed quickly and then get on to treatment to avoid um, actually having the worst elements of that disease. And then satisficing that people naturally will often look for acceptable alternatives instead of looking for the uh, um, ideal or optimal solution. Um, and then what we can really do is to try and fight that satisficing in order to get physicians or patients to try and get the best possible outcome for themselves. Uh, so some ways to really use these um, heuristics um, for the physicians. Um, disease states where death is inevitable, that's going to be a trigger for dread risk bias. Um, rare diseases, um, this is going to be especially important. Uh, dread risk bias, it's not going to fit for chronic heart failure for older people because that's a very common disease. So dread risk is not about something that's going to happen to many of us. Um, so it would hit, fit for kind of being diagnosed for rare diseases when you're older or for any kind of older type disease when you're younger. Um, it certainly fits for disease states where progression is rapid or irreversible. So it may not be likely to happen, but if it does, you're not gonna be able to improve it. Uh, disease states where existing therapies are insufficient. And then disease states where you're introducing a new MOA to really extend survival or progression. And then this would be a case where like it may be a disease state where there may be a little bit more side effects, but the um, efficacy, it can really have a market impact. On the patient side, um, it can be leveraged for patients who have failed on previous therapies or the standard of care if we're trying to get them to um, move to something that's actually far better than what they typically are used to. Um, also disease states that, can, um, that involve either newer diseases or newer treatments. And then disease states are often are diagnosed too late. There's many um, cancers where the biggest issue is they're diagnosed so late, like pancreatic cancer is so deadly because it's typically diagnosed when it's already metastasized. But if you actually were able to catch pancreatic cancer at stage one, it becomes far more treatable. 
So getting people to get those right um, treatments or like um, if you think about there's many other diseases that, that early um, diagnosis can allow for early treatment and then avoiding these devastating consequences. In comparison, um, satisficing uh, disease states where physicians often take a conservative approach. Um, disease states where physicians will switch patients from suboptimal existing therapy is the goal. So we want to move them from a therapy that's just good enough and not truly meeting their needs. Uh, disease states where you're introducing a molecule that is su significantly superior to other options. Um, on the patient side, um, conditions where patients will often try home remedies before approaching a physician. So getting them to go to the physician immediately as opposed to waiting too long to actually get the right treatment. Uh, conditions where the disease state awareness is limited and there aren't enough resources to truly learn about the best treatment options. So these are a variety of kind of different ways that we can really approach each one of these different heuristics. So that takes us through um, everything we wanted to cover today. So again, um, take a quick break, see if we have any questions. Okay, great. So thanks everybody for joining today. And then um, we hope that all of you will join us next month for our next class.